All right, let's continue with another candle keep adventure for level six characters. And this one's called the Book of Cylinders. So they tell you 15 years ago, this book was brought to candle keep and it was recovered from a ruined keep. Now, this book right here is not really something that just tells a story. It actually talks about a conflict which is currently going on among this group called the Gripply, which are little frog-like humanoids, and the evil yon teal snake people. You're probably familiar with those right there. So how does this adventure begin? This one's really straightforward. They tell you that a robed dragonborn that works at Candlekeep will actually approach them and say, your adventures, are you not? I have something that requires your unique talents. So he quickly tells them that Candlekeep relies on these gripply frog people to the north for fresh seafood. They raise these giant crabs, and I mean they are giant, you'll see a picture of them further along, out in these watery pens. But lately they've become less active, and there's been rumors of a snake, serpent-like people, attacking them. So this is what Candlekeep wants the group, the party of adventurers, to investigate. So they tell them that news of all this has also come about through this ship captain. Looks like Midar Jans is his name. And he offers to take the adventurers to the Gripply leader, who is currently now in a different area, not too far from where their village was at. But they need to speak to this leader to find out exactly what's going on. So you'll see further along, there's really three adventure areas. One is this refugee camp where the Gripply originally just did some trading, but they've been forced here at this point. So the refugee, refugee camp is really adventure area one. Then the old village that got attacked where the crab pens are at is the second. And then an old village the frog people had abandoned has this old temple at it. This, this good group of Yanti were excavating. So we're going to see all three of those areas further along. So they talk about opening the book up. Again, they tell you right here, this is not really just a story. It's a current event, really, is what's going on, a warning about what's happening. So here's a picture of the book down here at the bottom. But they call it the Book of Cylinders because there are three cylinders in it and a spine somewhere which can be used. So they tell you that they'll find these three hollow wooden cylinders and also a bag of clay. It's kind of interesting. So what has to be done is that the clay has to be uh, moistened, has to have some water to it. So what they do is make out some moist clay, roll the cylinders over it, and then they have pages which can be read. And interesting, they're in dwarf right here. So this is going to tell what's going on with the frog people and their battle with the snake people, the Yanti. So each cylinder tells a little something different. The first one talks about the Gripply, the little frog people right here, and how they harvest these giant crabs out in these watery pens. The second one talks about the serpent people. At first, there was a nice group that came along looking to excavate an old temple at the frog people's old village home. And then a violent group of Yanti came about later and destroyed the village, killed some of the frog people, enslaved some, and ran the others away, and they're currently at the refugee camp. So they tell you that with the aftermath of all this, most of the buildings there have been flattened or destroyed, and the evil yon -T still have some of the gripply frog people, and they're tormenting them. We'll see how they do that further along. So if the adventurers ask more questions, they tell you they can learn more. They can learn more about this trading post and that a small band of yon -T have taken up residence at the old temple site. So again, the trading post is basically now the refugee camp. This temple site was an old home of the frog people. Again, originally, some friendly ones came along, and the Gripply didn't mind if they went to this old village and excavated. But then again, a second group of yon -T came along, and that's where all the trouble started right there. So to get to this trading post, which remember this again here is the refugee camp, they need to head north. So this ship captain, looks like Midar Jans right here, offers them transportation. Now you'll see if they don't trust him for whatever reason. There is a land route, but it's way more difficult. That'll be mentioned here further along. So for the sea voyage, this captain right here is a good person. He's straightforward with them. His ship's name is the Dog Ear. Interesting little name right there for a ship. But that is by far the best way to get to this refugee camp. They tell you that by his ship, it's only 36 hours, so not far at all. 
So they give you just a little information on this captain right here. They tell you he's not going to give them any trouble in any way, but him and his crew will not help the party fight. That's going to be entirely up to them. Now, if they don't want to go with him on his ship, there is a land journey. But they tell you this is a 100-mile trip that's going to take at least seven days, and it's very hazardous. And also, if they take this route here, instead of getting to the village with the crab pens, which is how the ship will take them, they're instead going to get to the old village where the excavated ruins are at before that. So depending on how the party leaves Candlekeep, if they go with the captain, they're going to get to go to the uh, refugee camp and then the village where the crab pens are. He's going to take them to each of those places. But if they go the land route, which is much more hazardous, they sort of do everything in reverse order. They're going to go to actually the third area first, which is the old abandoned temple. So that's what they tell you in this section right here. But if you want to change that up many ways, as DM, no problem with that at all right there. So if they take the land route, they tell you make it hazardous. It's a very dangerous trip. So helping the Gripply right here. Now they tell you that the Gripply in general are a bit distrustful of strangers and all. And when they arrive, the players arrive at this refugee camp, well, that's understandable. They've recently been attacked, some of them been destroyed, so on down the line right there. They have a leader called the Pond Mother. The group will get to speak to her no trouble unless they start a problem, which hopefully they won't right there. Now, they tell you the frog people have difficulty speaking in the human language. They speak in something called primordial, just a little something to add in right there. Now, here's the ship captain again, Miter Jans right here. He will suggest that the party talks to the pond mother as soon as the ship arrives at the old trading post. Again, this is what's now the refugee camp right there. So again, if they go by water, 36 hours later, they'll be at the trading post. Don't have to have any encounters in between unless you want to throw one in. So once they get to the trading post as they approach, they'll hear the frog people croaking. That's just them talking. And they'll see that they have weapons. But they're not going to attack unless the party gives them reason. Remember, they usually do a lot of trading with the people associated with Candle Keep. So when the party arrives here, they're just going to see stone and mud brick buildings. They can tell this place is a mess. You think of a refugee camp, you know, there's nothing nice about it. So as DM, you give them that impression, you know, this is not a good place to live at all. So here's where they've made their new home because they just got ran out of their old village where the crab pens are at. And that's how they make their money. So once the party arrives here, they need to talk to the pond mother. So they tell you she's an aged gripply warrior. They got the stats for these guys at the end right here. We'll see that further along. But as long as they're polite, seem trustworthy, she'll speak to them no trouble. She will tell the party that originally a small band of Yan Ti arrived at their village, told them that they were followers of a deity called the Scaled Mother, they were friendly and wanted to go to the frog people's old village site and excavate an old temple. That's just a mile down the road from where they were currently living. So the frog people had no trouble with this. And these people here, these Yanti, didn't give them any trouble. But then they tell you, uh, 10 days later, a second group of Yanti came about to the village and attacked. So this is where all the trouble came from, is from the second group of snake people called the yon -ti. Now she'll tell them specifically that the yon -ti are also eating their eggs. And this is the most important thing to the frog people right here. They'll know that some of their uh, people, frog people have been in prison. So of course they'd like to see them freed and so on down the line. They've been taken to the old village site. They're gonna be working trying to excavate there. But if the party can save some of the eggs of the gripply frog people, they'll be very thankful. If the players demand payment, the pond mother can give them up to 200 gold. That's all they've got right there. And where the refugee camp is, which is this trading post, well, their old village is not far, by sea, five miles away. And again, the ship captain Jans will happily, happily take them there. Now, when he takes them, <clears throat> he won't go all the way to land. He will drop them off just outside this crab maze. These are these big watery pens where these giant crabs are raised. And again, that's how these frog people make their money. That's what they've been selling to candle keep and such. So getting through this crab maze is actually the first big obstacle. So the ship's captain will take them. Again, it's just a few miles down, so it won't take them long at all. And gets to this crab maze. 
and stops offshore. So the part you'll see these columns of stone platforms, these are safe spots that are elevated above the water. They got a picture shows this a little bit further away. But there's lots of platforms, wooden gangways that connect them. And the party will be able to see the crabs moving below the water. Now, the problem is these crabs haven't been fed in quite a while. So ordinarily, they wouldn't be so vicious, but now they are because they're starving. So the party's got to get through this crab maze. As they run these gangways, there's a chance that they could be attacked. We're going to look at that further along. Every time they get to a platform, that's an elevated safe spot. Think of this as like baseball. Uh, this think of like the bases in a baseball game, right? These are the bases where they're safe. Running in between them is where the danger's at, right there. So again, getting across the crab maze just to land where the village is at is the first big challenge. So they tell you the maze is a collection of low to the water walkways. The crabs can just reach up and attack. <clears throat> and since they're starving, that's what'll happen. So some of these walkways are wide enough for two of the players to walk side by side. Some of the smaller ones just single file. Just depends on the platform there. At the areas that are sort of the bases, the safe platforms that are elevated, four creatures can stand there. But again, the crabs haven't been fed recently and they are hungry to attack anything they can. So what's the party have to do to get across this maze of watery pens filled with these crabs? They tell you that nothing bigger than a rowboat can navigate through this maze. And they've got to go in rowboats because the water's way too shallow for the ship. So they couldn't attack the captain and take over the ship and run it aground. That's not going to work for them right there either. And they can't walk it. There's too many crabs. They'd be too slow. They'd get eaten alive. They'd never make it through. So they're going to take these rowboats through this maze. So they tell you that every 100 feet, and there's a map coming up here that shows you the maze and all that, They'll have to roll, as a party, a DC 20 dexterity stealth check. Well, every time they fail that, every 100 feet, 1d4 plus 2 giant crabs is going to attack. Now, again, as they go through the maze, if they get to these processing platforms, those are elevated. Those are safe spots. But in between is where they have to make those rolls. So passing the breakwater. Once the party navigates this maze and gets past the crabs, they're going to get to a safe spot called the breakwater just before the village. We'll see that on the map here in just a second. They tell you they can climb over this little low wall here, no trouble. That wall is just to stop uh, incoming waves and things like that to protect the village. Now, at the village, once they get past this breakwater and such, there are several yon -ti roaming around. They're pretty arrogant and confident about where they're at, so they tell you they're not really watching for intruders. Now, if the party was able to slip past the crabs, say they make their dexterity checks, maybe they move invisible, whatever it may be. If they get past the crabs quietly, they won't be seen by these yon -ti. They could actually slip into the village unnoticed. But if they did a lot of fighting and especially use magic spells like magic missile, fireball, anything like that, the yon -ti will have seen them and they'll be waiting to ambush them just as soon as they come up out of the water at the village. And they tell you this group right here will fight to the death. So that may be their first encounter with the snake people, at least if they came in by water. Remember, if they come in by land, they're going to run all this in the opposite order. So here you can see these walkways and look at the size of that giant crab next to a person. These things are huge. But see the elevated platforms? Those are the safe spots right there. So as always, they do an incredible job with that artwork there. <laughs> so let's say they get past the crab maze. Now they're at the village. This is where the evil yon -ti attacked and ran them out of this area. This was the home of the frog people here. So they tell you it's very marshy. Mud brick buildings, uh, pieces of crabs used to build some of the structures and so on down the line. So if they got here quietly, they can slip around this village because remember the yon -ti aren't really looking for any threats. So they tell you there's still a dozen or so of the frog people warriors here. Now they're currently slaves of the yon -ti. They tell you, you can see they've been abused and beaten. And the yon -ti even find it amusing to eat the frog eggs in front of the frog people just to torture them. So they're not nice at all. Once they get past the breakwater to the docks, they tell you this is a very sturdy area here. And there's a few small boats which are still here. So say once the party completes all the adventuring, when they get ready to leave, they could use these boats to go right back out to the ship captain 
who's waiting out in the water back past the crab pens. So once they get here, they'll need to make their way eventually to the pond mother's home. They tell you that this was really the center of the village right here. It's made of wood and mud and so on down the line. But now it's basically been turned into a little prison here. So they'll tell you that where the evil Yanti are holding some of the followers of the scaled mother will be found here. Now remember, these are the good Yanti that came about first. They weren't in any trouble at all, but the evil ones are holding them captive here. They'll tell you they'll see a pool of water in here. There's an opening in the roof, and this is where ceremonies used to take place in this area. So we'll look at that village map above here in just a second. But again, once they make it into this area where the good yon tea are being held by some of the evil ones, they tell you there's two staircases, goes up to a second floor, and it's got four chambers, 10 feet square, nothing much there. But notice here, three of the rooms hold a total of 10 wounded yon tea pure bloods, right? If you look up yon tea in the monster manual, you'll see these right here. Now again, these are the good ones that came about first. They have half their hit points, they're neutral good. They're being guarded by four evil Yanti purebloods. So they tell you that these guards right here stay at their stations unless they hear something going on outside that's pretty significant, like battle or something such as that. So if they hear some commotion outside like battle, they'll rush outside to attack. The prisoners will stay until all the evil Yanti have been beaten. And then at that time right there, the prisoners can be freed, and they'll tell them everything they know. They'll say, hey, look, we just came to excavate this temple at this old site, which is just a mile or so up the road. The evil ones attacked, and of course, the frog people back them up on all this right here. So they know that two of the good Yanti have been hauled through the marsh northward to an old temple at the old frog people village. So again, this is where the good ones were doing their excavation. Now the evil ones have taken two of the good ones there to be sacrificed to the evil deity. Looks like Seth is the name. Mm. So they also mentioned the brood pools. But before we get to that, notice the map. Now again, the captain will probably drop them off out here in the water somewhere. If the party comes in by land, don't forget they're going to run all this in the opposite direction. Sort of from right to left over here. But again, if they go with the captain, they'll have to navigate the pins. Navigating these pins will probably require at least 10 or more of those dexterity checks that were talked about every 100 feet. But here's the breakwater. That's a safe spot right there. The docks are sturdy. There's a couple of boats here they can use to get back out later if they need. And notice right here, all these little dots are the huts where the village of the frog people are at, or the old one before they were attacked and ran off. And there's the pond mother's home. It's bigger than the others. It'll stand out. So mention it to them as DM. Now here's the brood pools where the frog people's eggs are at. So they tell you on the outskirts, there it is right there, <clears throat> this is the nursery. There's basically five structures that look like wells, right? Think like little walls three feet high made of uh, stone or whatever. Well, in each of those five little well-like containers is where the eggs are at. So they tell you this location is under control of four Yanti purebloods and two of the, I guess that's pronounced Melisans right there. So again, if you look in the monster manual, you'll see these purebloods, I believe the ones that look mostly human, these Melisans are bigger and stronger and have like a snake-like head to them right there. So notice they permit some of the slaved frog people, the Gripoli, to tend to the eggs because the Yanti like to eat them. And again, they'll make, make the frog people watch every day as they eat one. So they tell you that all six of these Yanti are just sort of hanging out. Again, they're not really watching for invaders. They're pretty confident that they're safe right here. Now, once a battle breaks out, they tell you that if any one of those two Malisons is still alive after three rounds, he's going to start to poison these five pools where the eggs are at. So on the third round, he's going to pour poison into one of those pools. And each round after that, he's going to poison another one. So it'll take him up to five rounds to do that. Hopefully the party can stop him before he does that. Because remember, the frog people value their eggs over everything else. They'll be very thankful if the party saves them. But once they've gotten past this area here, they follow this river for a mile, and here's the old village. Again, this is where the frog people used to live, and here's where the good Yanti were excavating this old temple site. 
So let's see what's going on at the old temple site there. Here's a little picture of it. Very simple. Just a 10-foot walled area here and then a separate smaller one on the inside. So they mentioned homes and storage back in the camp, right, in the village we were just at where the pool of eggs was at and so on. They tell you there's nothing really to see. Very, very modest homes made of mud and brick with a wicker roof right there. And they'll tell you that the frog people don't actually sleep in the water. They like to hang hammocks over the water and sleep like that. Then the storage huts are very primitive too, but they're on stilts. That way, whatever's stored inside won't get ruined by water. Now, getting to the old village, again, that's what is at the top right of that map where that temple was at. So, again, if they'll follow the river for a mile or so, they won't be able to miss the old village with the temple in it. So, here's where they'll find it here. The only structure left is this old village temple. Before the evil Yanti got here, remember the good group of Yanti who worshipped the scaled mother were excavating this temple site. Now, the work is still continuing but the evil Yanti are in charge now. Remember, they took two of the good Yanti to this area to be sacrificed. Now, what are they doing? Why are they sacrificing these two good Yanti? We'll see here in just a second. They'll tell you as the party approaches this temple area, some of the frog folk will there, and with hand signals, they'll like point and say, hey, go towards this courtyard area. They know that there are prisoners being held there, so they won't help them, but they'll point them in the right direction. So notice the courtyard right here. It got a big 10-foot high wall around it. Players could go right up these steps. They could come over, whatever they wanted right there. Now, in this courtyard, there's some stairs leading down either side, but this is completely blocked by rubble at this point right here. As they get into the courtyard, they tell you they'll be safe in this area. There's no yon T in this region. All the actions happen up here behind this curtain in this smaller rectangular region up there at the top. So the party can rest here for a while safely if they want, but they'll hear screaming and cries of the tortured yon T happening inside. So what's going on in this smaller area up here? where it sounds like somebody's being tortured and killed. So there's the inner courtyard area. Again, there's a 10-foot wall around this area too. They'll see a bright light at the far end and a horrific scene playing out. So what is this scene? What is going on here? The events are unfolding as the party enters. Lashed to a makeshift altar are two neutral good yon T, right? These two right here. Now they're being tortured by yon T abomination. Those are the ones that really look like snakes. They're really powerful. Some like 120 hit points. Those are tough guys. And there's a couple of either a couple of other yon T malisons with this one. So these three evil ones are torturing and killing two of the good yon T. So they tell you they'll see a lantern being held and a chime. These are actually magical devices they're going to look at further along. The abomination Yanti is studying the script on a sarcophagus at the far end of the chamber. And they'll notice if they watch the party will that this chime is being struck. And every time it is, a seam around the lid of the sarcophagus grows black, <laughs> glows brightly and it opens a little. And every time it opens a little bit, the good Yanti are damaged or injured even more. So it's killing them to open up this sarcophagus. <laughs> so the evil Yanti, once they notice the characters, are actually going to try and complete the ritual. That's their real goal right here. So they tell you that uh, uh, their first part is complete the ritual, which opens the lid, which will kill the prisoners. Don't forget about that. You know, if the ritual is completed, the good Yanti are going to be killed right there. But if the party works quickly, they can attack the evil ones up above. They tell you that the abomination needs two turns to finish this ritual and open that sarcophagus. So if the players can strike him and interrupt his concentration in two turns, he's going to ignore the ritual and attack the group with the two other evil ones. So the uh, Yanti up above are actually using a chime of opening and a lantern of revealing right there. And once the party has killed them, they can use that chime to open the lid. They just strike it one more time. And inside this sarcophagus are some magical items, a suit of serpent scale armor and a serpent's fang. So that's a really good suit of armor and a weapon that adds poison damage. I thought it was really anticlimactic. There wasn't some kind of creature inside. I think as DM, 
I would have some type of undead yon wearing this armor and using this sword. And once they kill that individual, then they've got the magic items. So the aftermath. Once all these evil yon have been killed, well, everybody that's still left, the nice yon and the frog people, are going to be very happy. They're going to be uh, very helpful to the party right now in any way that they can. So again, the good Yanti tell them that they were actually worshippers of the Scaled Mother. Again, they're the nice ones who didn't do any harm to anybody right here. They were excavating, finding relics. The evil ones came along, started killing everybody, ran the frog people to the trading post. You know the story right there. So the good benevolent Yanti will continue digging. They're going to keep looking for whatever it is in this temple area. And if the DM wants Make your own map of a lower temple area full of treasures and traps and whatever monsters you want. This old temple I would have, since it's an uh, old yon -Ti temple, I would have undead yon -Ti and whatever else you want to throw in there. I'm surprised they didn't give a map with a lower level just in case you wanted to do it for the heck of it. Who wouldn't? That sounds like something fun to do with the party. So I'd create that lower level with whatever monsters you want inside. Now, again, the remaining frog people will be very thankful. They tell you that they're going to return to their village once these evil Yanti have been destroyed. They're going to rebuild it quickly. I think they said in a 10-day or something such as that. So they're going to go right back to raising the giant crabs in the pens, providing the meat to candle keep, which was really the goal of all this to start with right here. Now, if the party saved one or more of the eggs in the pools, the frog people will be very happy. They'll tell the players they want to perform a ceremony on them. And what they'll do is take the party to the pond mother's home. Put them in this ritual pool at midnight. The frog people are going to do a lot of croaking, sort of like chanting. They'll see the water swirling and lighting up around them. The party will go into a trance, and when they wake up at dawn, they'll be able to speak and understand the frog people's language. So that's the gift that'll be given to them by the frog people. So there's all the information on the little gripply frog people right here. There you can see, not often you see some type of amphibious, uh, nice, good group, but that's exactly what they are. So lots of potential adventure right here. Have them explore the underground parts of that temple. And remember, there's an award, reward for this back at Candle Keep once all the bad guys have been defeated and the good guys go right back to raising crabs. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, video right here. Until next time, good luck and good gaming.